This world has faced financial crisis since the time period of World War II. However, this specifically talks on the financial crisis of 2008 to 2009. The financial crisis of this time period left banks, businesses and everyone else bankrupt. Where people had to face huge losses in businesses, many had to give up their homes in order to pay the debt. What actually caused the downfall of the whole world? Was it that bad or did it bring along any benefits? To find it out all, we'd be covering the following topics. Introduction to financial crisis. Causes of financial crisis. Four good outcomes of financial crisis. How can it be prevented in future? Since the depression of the 1930s, the US, along with major economic agencies, has been making their way through the financial crisis from the start of 2007. A lot of businesses failed, banks were forecasted to lose a huge sum of money and unemployment rate reached to its maximum in these years. Not just this, but many families were left homeless as a result of this crisis. This all occurred not because of a single reason, but a lot of factors contributed. They played their part and resulted in the downfall of the world economy. The causes have been discussed in detail, as you will find out. The worldwide financial crisis of 2008 brought about the limitation of worldwide development as well as incited a retreat of globalization from its highs of the past two decades. In the event that the 1990s were the high point for globalization and the period prompting 2008 was the continuation of globalism, the years that took after 2008 were surely spectators to the retreat of the globalization process. The explanation behind this is the coordinated and interconnected worldwide economy was shaken with monetary and budgetary stunts in 2008, which implied that the worldwide stunts delivered a withdrawal of worldwide exchange and global development. As worldwide and universal exchange supports globalization, any solidity in the volumes of worldwide exchange has a thump on the impact on the worldwide economy and by augmentation the globalization process. For instance, the Baltic Dry Index, which is a measure of the overall transportation action, fell forcefully and even divided in the period taking after 2008, which shows the degree to which globalization withdrew in the years taking after 2008. Further, as worldwide development loosened and worldwide exchange backed off, nations started to decrease universal exchange and swing to household utilization drove development. Every one of these components had the impact of backing off the producers of globalization from its highs of the 1990s and the mid-2000s. For the second time in seven years, the bursting of a major asset bubble has inflicted great damage on world financial markets. In both cases, the equity bubble in 2000 and the credit bubble in 2007, central banks were asleep at the switch. The lack of monetary discipline has become a hallmark of unferreted globalization. Central banks have failed to provide a stable underpinning to world financial markets and to an increasingly asset-dependent global economy. Stephen Roach, Morgan Stanley Introduction to Financial Crisis In 2008, the United States encountered a noteworthy financial crisis which prompted the most genuine subsidence since the Second World War. Both the financial crisis and the downturn in the US economy spread to numerous countries, bringing about a worldwide financial emergency. On September 15, 2008, Lehman Brothers, one of the biggest venture banks on the planet, failed. Throughout the following couple of months, the US securities exchange plunged, liquidity became scarce, fruitful organizations laid off representatives by the thousands, and interestingly, there was no more any doubt a subsidence was upon the American individuals. Eleven months after the fall of Lehman Brothers, the US stays in a condition of limbo. 
Recommendations for stimulus packages and other bailout plans have given some elevation. However, it appears the best cure so far has been time. Definition of Financial Crisis A financial crisis is a state in which the worth of financial institutions or assets drops down swiftly. A financial crisis is often linked with a fright or a run on the banks in which investors sell off assets or pull out money from savings accounts with the hope that the rate of those assets will go down if they hang about at a financial institution. Stages in the crisis The financial crisis has developed in covering stages. The mortgage crisis Low interest in the mid-2000s urged numerous Americans to purchase homes. As an after-effect of the expended interest, home costs dramatically increased in the middle of the decade finishing in 2006, prompting a prevalent conviction that land costs would keep on rising inconclusively. Financial specialists from around the globe, willing to benefit from this unfaltering value rise, purchased new investment products fixing to contracts. So many people were willing to get new products that in order to satisfy them a lot more mortgages had to be sold out. But generally, the quantity of would-be home purchasers with great credit was restricted. Banks along these lines lose their loaning norms and empowered individuals who might have been turned down for advances a couple of years prior to acquiring more than they could manage, or to take out movable rate contracts with low introductory financing costs, however programmed rate expands that not all clients caught on. Large numbers of these borrowers couldn't stay aware of their instalments. At the point when home prices in the end fell, a few individuals found that they owned more on their home loans than their homes were worth. Numerous reacted by seizing their instalments. However, by September 2009, more than 14% of all home loan borrowers in the US were either behind on their instalments or else in dispossession. Land values fell in neighborhoods desolated by dispossession and the banks wound up owning a larger number of homes than they could offer. More than 100 home loan moneylenders went bankrupt in 2007 and 2008. The decrease in home estimations brought about overwhelming misfortunes for speculators around the globe and seriously harmed monetary organizations left with mortgage securities they could no more offer. In 2009, President Obama made a $75 billion arrangement to up to 9 million property holders in order to renegotiate their home loans or maintain a strategic distance from disposition. However, as of April 2010, just 170,000 family units had their home loans balanced. The Credit Crunch Just before the housing bubble burst, Americans took on more liability than ever before in the shape of mortgages, home equity loans, car loans and credit card debt. The major speculation banks took on more debt too, making them more susceptible when the economy took a recession. As more people botched to pay back their loans, mortgage-related funds lost value. Lenders found themselves with much less money to lend it became harder for business and individuals to get loans, which slowed down economic activity in common. As a comeback, the Federal Reserve, the central bank of the US, sliced its base interest rate to nearly 0% and the government lent billions to banks to facilitate them to start lending yet again. The government ignored to call for that the funds is to used for lending Nevertheless, and many banks use the money as a substitute to pay debts and get hold of other businesses. Bailouts for companies too big to fail In September 2008, Treasury Secretary Henry Paulson and New York Federal Reserve President Timothy Gaithner met with legislators and planned a $700 billion tragedy bailout to impel money into the system and turn aside economic upheaval. 
After preliminary defeat in the House of Representatives, the Emergency Economic Stabilization Act, also known as the Troubled Asset Relief Program, or TARP, was approved by Congress and signed into law by President Bush. Simultaneously, the big three American auto manufacturers, GM, Ford and Chrysler, came close to bankruptcy. The main reasons? Fewer people were buying new cars, and a lot of those who did opt for minor, more fuel-efficient foreign cars, and Detroit's labor costs, plus the cost of pension for retired workers, far surpassed those of its foreign competitors. In order to save these companies from going out of business, which would have cost up to 3 million jobs and destabilized confidence in the entire US economy, the federal government lent GM and Chrysler billions of dollars and asked them to endure reformation. The financial crisis became President Obama's first priority the moment he took office. Congress passed his $787 billion stimulus proposal in February 2009, with only three Republican votes in the Senate and not even one in the House of Representatives. Global Recession the crisis has spread a long ways past the borders. A few European banks put intensely in mortgage-backed securities and their misfortunes put some of them bankrupt. Numerous nations have swung to the International Monetary Fund, an office of the UN, for crisis help. All around the globe, lack of cash accessible for credits has brought about contracting monetary action, lowered down interest for products and lost employments. The US, China and different nations reacted with plans in 2008 wanting to restore their economics with a combination of assets. Numerous national banks sliced loan costs practically to zero after the lead of the US central bank. In late 2009, Greece's new executive reported that his nation's deficiency was three times the size his antecedent had consented. Other Southern European countries, including Spain, Italy and Portugal, had additionally overborrowed while loan fees were low and wound up in a bad position when the worldwide economy soured. The more unwavering economies of Northern Europe opposed bailing out the overdrawn South. But in May 2010, the European Union's Parliament accepted loan packages worth nearly $1 trillion to help the economies in the problem. The results remain to be seen. Uncertainty Major American banks were procuring benefits again in 2009. By April 2010, beneficiaries of bailout assets had paid back everything except $89 billion. As of May 2011, the Dow Jones Industrial Average, a record of the stock costs of some of America's greatest organizations, had recaptured 5,600 of the 7,000 points it lost between October 2007 and February 2009. General Motors and Chrysler got away bankruptcy and Ford posted benefits in 2009 and 2010 without a bailout. Be that as it may, credit stayed tight for fewer borrowers and unemployment drifted above 9% from July 2009 to July 2010, most elevated amounts following 1983. Two pressing goals are presently in conflict. The need to empower the economy and haul the nation out of subsidence and the need to start moving back a shortage that remained at more than $14 trillion by August 2011. Despite the fact that most financial analysts agree that government is spending more than it is required, the Monetary Allowance Agreement went in August 2011 incorporates trillions of dollars in spending cuts. Causes of Financial Crisis Majority of people hold opinion regarding who caused the financial crisis of 2008 to 2009. Was it securitization, greed, deregulation or anything else? There were a couple of reasons which resulted in this major financial crisis of the year 2008 and not a single thing can be held accountable for it. 
it can't be come down to one, two or even a modest bunch of underlying causes. It was rather the result of many variables. Some of these are generally known, yet numerous others are definitely not. This chapter is a comprehensive one, which discusses a total of 25 major factors which causes the financial crisis. First, market-to-market -market accounting. In the mid-1990s, the Securities and Exchange Commission and the Financial Accounting Standards Board began requiring open organizations to value their assets at market value instead of historical expense, a practice that had been undermined and surrendered in the middle of the Great Depression. This pushed basically every bank in the nation into indebtedness from an accounting point of view when the credit market ceased in 2008 and 2009, subsequently making it difficult to value resources. Second, ratings agencies. The financial emergency couldn't have happened if the three appraisals organizations, Standard and Poor's, Fitch and Moody's, hadn't recognized subprime securities as speculation grade. Part of this was inadequacy. Some portion of it originated from an incompatible situation, as the ratings agencies were paid by guarantors to rate the securities. Third, infighting among financial regulators. Since its beginning in 1934, the FDIC has been the most dynamic bank controller in the nation. The others have at some time incorporated the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency, the Federal Reserve, the Office of Thrift Supervision, the Securities and Exchange Commission, the Federal Savings and Loan Insurance Corporation and a variety of state administrative organizations. Be that as it may, on account of infighting among controllers, the FDIC was successfully prohibited from inspecting funds and speculation banks inside of the OTSs and CECs essential locale, somewhere around 1993 and 2004. Not adventitiously, those were the organizations that wound up wrecking the most devastation. Fourth, securitization of loans. Banks generally held the greater part of the loans that they started. Doing as such gave moneylenders motivating motivation, though incompletely, to endorse loans that had just a little risk of defaulting. That approach passed by the wayside, in any case, with the presentation and duplication of securitization. Securitization of loans With the presentation and duplication of securitization. Since the beginning, bank doesn't hold securitized loans, there is less motivating force to nearly screen the nature of endorsing guideliness. Fifth, credit default swap. These are extravagant financial instruments J.P. Morgan Chase created in the 1990s that permitted banks and other institutional investors to safeguard against loan defaults. This circumstance drove numerous individuals in the budgetary business to declare a conclusion to credit threat. The issue, obviously, is that credit risk was just supplanted by counterparty hazard as organizations, for example, American International Group collected significantly more legal responsibility than they would ever plan to cover. Sixth, economic ideology. As the 1970s and 80s advanced, a developing cohort of economists started converting about the omissions of excessive free markets. This discussion energized the deregulatory enthusiasm coursing through the economy at the time and it prompted the conviction that, in addition to other things, there have to be no administrative body regulating credit default swaps. 7th. Greed. The longing to get rich isn't a terrible thing, from a financial point of view. It is no doubt important to fuel economic development. Be that as it may, insatiability turns out to be awful when it's taken to the extremes. This is what has made it the topmost cause of the financial crisis. Property holders needed to get rich fast by flipping land. 
contract originators put forth an admiral attempt, legitimate and something else, to amplify credit volumes. Home appraisers did likewise. Brokers were paid absurd amount of cash to securitize dangerous subprime contracts. Rating organizations raked in benefits by ordering generally lethal securities as speculation evaluation. Controllers were centered on getting a greater paycheck in the private part. Moreover, lawmakers tried to pick up notoriety by constraining banks to loan cash to their untrustworthy constituents. Eighth, fraud. While not many financiers have been indicated for their part in the financial crisis, don't take it as if they did not imply to confer fraud. Without a doubt, the proof is overpowering that solidifies up and down Wall Street intentionally securitized and sold Lille home mortgage-backed securities to institutional speculators, including insurance agencies, annuity stores, college endowments and sovereign riches reserves, among others. Ninth, Short-term investment horizons In the number one spot up to the crisis, Analysts and investors rebuked well-run firms, for example, J.P. Morgan Chase and Wells Fargo, for not taking after their companions' lead into the most risky sorts of subprime mortgage loans, securities and subordinates. In the meantime, the organizations that succumbed to the siren tune of a snappy benefit, Citigroup for example, were the first to fall flat when the house of cards came tumbling down. Tenth. Politics. Since the 1980s, bankers and government officials have framed an uneasy conspiracy. By altering the endorsement of bank mergers on the Community Reinvestment Act, politicians from both sides of the path have successfully coerced banks into giving loans to uncreditworthy borrowers. While banks and institutional speculators ingested the dangers, Government officials trumpeted their part in extending the American long for home ownership. 11th. Off balance sheet risk. Why did investors permit money related firms to accept so much risk? The answer is that nobody comprehended what they were up to, in light of the fact that the majority of the unsafe assets weren't showed in the balance sheets. They had been securitized and sold off to institutional investors, yet with leftover risk coming from guarantees that went with the deals or were corralled in alleged exceptional purposes elements, which are free trusts that the banks built up and directed. Suffice it to say that the greater part of the remaining risk overflowed back onto the bank's asset report strictly. Twelfth. Bad economic assumptions. As moronic as it appears when looking back, it was for the most part expected before the crisis that home costs could never decrease all the while across the country premise. This conviction drove financiers off and speculators in mortgage backed securities to trust that geologically enhanced pools of the mortgage were basically hazard free when they clearly were most certainly not. 13th, High oil prices Starting with the twin oil embargoes of the 1970s, oil delivering nations started aggregating huge stores of purported petrodollars, which were then reused once more into the US financial system. This circumstance influenced banks and different sorts of financial firms to put the money to the job in ever more marginal ways, for example, subprime contracts. 14th, a broken international monetary system. A standout amongst the most overlooked reasons for the financial crisis was the imbalance in trade between the developed and developing worlds. By keeping their monetary standards misleadingly low versus the US dollar, which is finished by purchasing dollars with recently printed local monetary standards, trading countries, for example, China, gathered huge stores of dollars. Like the petrodollars of the 1980s and 90s, these assets were then reused once more into the US monetary framework. 
To put this cash to utilization, monetary firms had a minimal decision to bring down endorsing guideliness and consequently developing the pool of potential borrowers. 15th. The Rescue of Bear Stearns In March 2008, the Federal Reserve spared Bear Stearns with a last-minute $30 billion credit supply through J.P. Morgan Chase. Instead of fizzling, the country's fifth biggest venture bank at the time wound up being sold for $10 an offer. The issue with the rescue was basically that it diminished the motivating force on Lemon Brothers CEO Dick Fault to locate a private part answer for its considerably greater and in the long run lethal issues. Looking back, it appears to be moderately clear that the Fed should have either let Bear Stearns fall flat or considerably more ideally safeguarded those two out. 16th. Lehman Brothers Bankruptcy Permitting Lehman Brothers to fall flat was a fault of epic quantity. History unmistakably shows that the destruction of a noteworthy money center bank, be it a business or venture bank, quite often triggers wide-scale money-related frenzies. In 1873, it was J. Cook and Company. In 1884, it was Grant and Ward. In 1907, it was the Knickerbrocker Trust Company. One can continue endlessly with illustrations. The point being, in spite of the admittedly unpleasant thought of bailing out someone as insistently offensive as Dick Fault, it would have been a small price to pay to circumvent the successive economic carnage. 17th. The Greenspan Put For two decades following the stock market crash of 1987, the Federal Reserve, guided by then-Chairman Alan Greenspan, brought down loan costs after every major economic stun, a pattern that got to be known as the Greenspan Put. It was this system, planned to prevent monetary stuns from changing into financial downturns, that drove the National Bank to drop the Fed store's rate after the 9-11 terrorist assaults. Furthermore, it was this drop which gave the oxygen, maybe, to expand the lodging bubble. 18th. Monetary policy from 2004 to 2006. Pretty much as low loan fees prompted the lodging bubble, the Fed's approach of raising rates from 2004 to 2006 in the long run made it burst. 19th. Basel II Bank Capital Rules A time when an economy encounters extreme financial shock, one of the most concerning issues is that undercapitalized banks will be rendered indebted. This is valid to some degree in view of the absurd utilization of mark-to-market accounting in the middle of times of intense anxiety in the credit markets and to a limited extent since banks are exceptionally utilized, implying that they hold just little share of capital with respect to their benefits. The purported Basel II capital rules, which produced results in 2004, complemented this reality. The rules permitted banks to substitute subordinated obligation and convertible favoured stock in the spot of substantial normal value. The net result was that unmistakable normal value at certain major US banks declined to under 4% on the eve of the emergency. 20th. Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac much has been already composed about the part Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac played in making up to the number one spot up to the financial crisis, so no sharp on it here. To put it plainly, the issue was that these two quasi-public corporations turned out to be so centred on development in no matter what condition that they surrendered any similarity of responsible risk administration. Doing so, authorized mortgage brokers come criminal enterprises such as Countrywide Financial and AmeriQuest Mortgage to stuff the government-sponsored units to the gills with carelessly created subprime mortgages. 21st. The failure of Indimac Bank. The 32 billion Indimac Bank was the primary chief depository institution. It was technically thrift, as divergent to a commercial bank, to be unsuccessful during the crisis when the Office of Thrift Supervisions apprehended on July 11, 2008. 
In circumstances like these, the FDIC customarily insures all depositors and creditors against losses, regardless of the insurance limit. But in Indimac's case, it didn't. The FDIC preferred as an alternative to only assure deposits up to $1,100. Doing so sent a tremor of fear all through the financial markets and played a most important role two months later in the wakening run on Washington Mutual. 22nd. The Failure of Washington Mutual When Washington Mutual turned out to be unsuccessful in September 2008, the FDIC had perceived its slip-up in managing IndyMac Bank. However, this time around, while the FDIC secured all stores, regardless of as far as possible, it permitted $20 billion of Wamu's bonds to default. After that, banks thought that it was troublesome and any, in case unthinkable, to raise capital from anybody other than the US government. 23rd. Procyclical Regulation of Loan Loss Reserves the more one finds out about the reasons for the financial crisis, the more one acknowledges how bumbling the Securities and Exchange Commission is with regards to managing financial organizations. In 1999, the SEC brought an authorization activity against SunTrust banks, accusing it of controlling its profit by making unreasonable credit misfortune safes. At the time, default rates were greatly low driving the SEC to infer that SunTrust shouldn't be saving for future misfortunes. Banks observed and didn't really set aside saves until particular future misfortunes are likely and can be sensibly evaluated, by which point, obviously, the notorious ugly truth is as of now out in the open. 24th. Shadow Banking while several customer banks failed in the wake of financial crisis, they share little obligation regarding what really happened. That is, on the grounds that shadow banks, i.e. speculation banks and thrifts that didn't fall under the essential administrative domain of the Federal Reserve, FDIC, or to a lesser degree, the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency, brought on the majority of the harm. Here's Richard Kovacevic, the previous administrator and CEO of Wells Fargo, addressing this point in a speech toward the end of a year ago. If you don't remember anything else I say today, please remember this. Only about 20 financial institutions perpetrated this crisis. About half were investment banks and the other half were savings and loans. Only one, Citicorp, was a commercial bank, but it was operating more like an investment bank. These 20 failed in every respect from business practices to ethics. Greed and malfeasance were their modus operandi. There was no excuse for their behavior and they should be punished thoroughly, perhaps even criminally. 25th. Ignorance of history. Regarding the financial framework, it can't be said repeatedly that history repeats itself time and time again. The financial crisis of 2008 to 2009 may seem exceptional, but it was only the most up-to-date in a series of eerily parallel crises that have struck the US economy from the time when the country was founded more than 200 years ago. In short, crises similar to these don't have to be predictable. But they will persist to be so if every other generation's leading financiers don't spend some time in the library knowledge about the faults of their predecessors. As former FDIC chairman Irving Sprague put it, Unburdened with the experience of the past, each generation of bankers believes it knows best and each new generation produces some who have to learn the hard way. Four Good Outcomes of Financial Crisis A lot has happened from the time Lehman Brothers got bankrupt. Barack Obama entered the White House and stayed there. Washington has put set up an essential new rule to oversee Wall Street. Silicon Valley has supplanted Wall Street as the spot to get rich. It got harder to get a mortgage loan than it ever was. 
in spite of the fact that an auto credit has turned somewhat simpler. Stock costs starve and afterward bounce back and are currently higher than they were before the financial crisis, however looked somewhat rough lately. The US again hopes to have a standout amongst the most stable economies on the planet and the unemployment is almost as low as it once might have been. Given the recuperation and the viewpoints of all, this time one may be enticed to ask, was the financial crisis all that terrible? The answer obviously is yes. Yes, it was an awful wreckage of incredible scale that began with millions confronting the possibility of losing their homes and brought on a financial crisis that left so many people unemployed. With that being said, not everything related to the financial crisis or what has left it was awful. Here are a couple of things you can be thankful of the financial crisis. Financial education for all. Before the financial crisis, just a couple of individuals on Wall Street and financial analysts realized what a collateralized obligation commitment was or that the Americans were deep in debt. At that point, all of a sudden, everyone knew everything. Most significantly, people were acknowledged regarding the fact that bad loans are not only bad for the borrower but can result in the downfall of an entire economy if left unchecked. Now, supervisors as well as watchdogs are on the watch out for the subsequent debt bomb, whether it's student loans or auto lending that could take down the economy. It not only included the non-financial types that learned something in the financial crisis. Even former Fed chairman Alan Greenspan stated that he learned somewhat from the financial crisis. Preceding the financial crisis, he said he deemed that Wall Streeters acting in their own self-interest could regulate themselves from doing immensely stupid things. How wrong he was! People could deal with their own personal debt problems. In the run-up to the financial crisis, the total percentage of household-related debt to GDP rose up to 100%. This is what actually broke the entire system. It was not only painful for the bankers, but for everyone else too. But if one examines the current situation, it can be assessed that the household debt problem is very much under control, as the percentage of GDP has fallen back to somewhat 80%. Yes, a great arrangement of the individual obligation was moved to the legislature through spending on stimulus to get the economy out of the retreat. Obviously, in the end, everyone will need to manage that. Be that as it may, government obligation is to a lesser degree a delay in the economy than household. So in any event for the present, people are now in better financial shape. Wall Street is no longer the center of economy. In the mid-2000s, particularly in the wake of the dot-com bust, Wall Street, as appeared, was the spot to be not just for individuals who were simply hoping to gain profit, but also for math wizards who looked forward to making innovations. All of these innovations together made the market for more risky and complicated. Today, the technology segment and Silicon Valley have turned out to be the most energetic parts of the economy. In addition to this, Wall Street is significantly less productive than it used to be. That is something worth being thankful for. Numerous studies have demonstrated that economies that are ruled by their financial sector don't do well in the whole deal. Bank Stress Tests At the point when Timothy Gaithner reported the bank stress test a couple of months into the financial crisis, numerous individuals rejected it as simply one more band help, something that may cover up the issues for a bit, however, not mend them completely. A lot of them required a much bolder move, such as nationalizing the managing an account part or something similar to that. However, the stress tests completely worked. After the administration gave the biggest banks in America a careful and to some degrees open examination and a clean bill of health, things began to show signs of improvement. Moreover, the Fed made the stress tests a yearly thing which has been a major component in disposing of the most noticeably awful loaning homes and hazardous conduct at the greatest banks. How to prevent another financial crisis 
In 2008, everyone saw the results of the risky dismissive loaning and economic works on coming about because of the false belief system that budgetary markets can, by one means or another, appropriately guard themselves. Inconsistent home loan norms and an unfortunate amount of danger taken by financial organizations and other business sector members prompted an economy that was not established as a general rule. The outcome was a progression of occasions that left a permanent imprint on the financial, the lodging market and the lifestyle of Americans. In a matter of weeks, some of the biggest monetary establishments were at risk of coming up short just lemon sputtered out right away. However, others were saved from that destiny by the kind-heartedness of the American citizens. Some were pushed into hastily masterminded mergers. The American economy was pushed to the edge of the breakdown, wiping out the life funds of a great many Americans, becoming scarce credit for families and little organizations, and touching off a scarcity plague that kept on decimating states and groups across the nation. The numbers represent themselves. About 9 million occupations were crushed as the unemployment rate multiplied. Dispossessions dislodged more than 11 million Americans, which added to a decrease in home estimations of more than 30%. All told, the financial crisis cost the country more than $13 trillion in financial yield, the likeness a year's gross domestic output. While activities by Congress, the Federal Reserve and Department of Treasury inevitably staunched the dying, it was clear that a monstrous change of the country's financial system was important to reset the economy and prevent any future emergency. Therefore, my associates in Congress passed Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act. Dodd-Frank changed the world view for how purchasers, speculators and other business sector members associate with the money-related framework. It has given oversight to the money-related division, giving controllers the apparatuses to end the time of too huge to fail elements and citizen bailouts and put another government office on the forefronts of shielding purchasers from awful performance in the monetary framework. All through the civil arguments, Republicans opposed, hindering and contradicting these endeavors without offering any valuable choices. They kept demagoguing the issue right up till the present time. After all, this time people have gained checked ground in turning the economy around. Unemployment is down, home costs are up and credit is accessible. Be that as it may, to protect everyone against the risk of another budgetary fiasco, there is still much to achieve. In the first place, people should ensure that the monetary recovery reaches the working class and little organizations. The Federal Reserve's present approach of asset purchases, known as quantitative easing, has been instrumental in lowering down unemployment, reinforcing the economy and keeping loan costs low. Some people hail the Federal Reserve's late choice to proceed with this project until there is more proof that financial advancement will be managed. Be that as it may, to guarantee a more strong financial recuperation, one should move far from the current monetary strategy, which is demonstrating counterproductive to that objective. This incorporates stretching out help to those as yet confronting abandonment through the government home affordable adjustment and renegotiation programs, offering decreases in Maine on mortgages that are sponsored by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, and urging choices to make understudy advance repayment more reasonable for battling borrowers. People should grow the Neighbourhood Stabilisation Programme, an example of overcoming adversity that gives financing to districts to buy and redevelop dispossessed or deserted properties, so they don't further discourage lodging costs or prompt neighbourhood curse. Second, more needs are to be accomplished in order to prevent the financial crisis in future. One should be aware of overburdening of little banks and credit unions, the drivers of group improvement. In any case, in the three years since Dodd-Frank was instituted, around 60% of rulemaking due dates have been missed. People should join President Obama in encouraging the quick execution of the remaining tenets, bolstered by full financing for one's administrative organizations. 
Third, Americans require a Federal Reserve seat that will proceed with the flow, arrangements of development and completion the work of executing Dodd-Frank. People keep on believing that their country needs an applicant who comprehends the effect of the Fed's strategies on the white-collar class and the vital harmony between stable costs and low unemployment. Ultimately, a government should capably slow down Fannie and Freddie while guaranteeing solidness in the lodging market. The positioning individuals from the House Financial Services Committee should take a shot at a methodology that preserves the 30-year mortgage contract, keeps up access for every single qualified borrower that can support home ownership and guarantees access to reasonable rental lodging. It will likewise give little foundations and group banks direct access to the optional home loan markets. The financial crisis of 2008 has caused a lot of destruction, not only in America, but almost every part of the world has also felt lessons which were important to be learned. It was not the first time the world faced something like this, but it prevailed since the time of World War II. However, what every individual should learn from this is that they must play their part honestly in keeping the economy of the world sound and stable. Only then can all this be avoided in times to come.